Hi friends, I'm Santanam from Smart Leaders IAS. In this video, we will be looking at the editorials which came on the Hindu newspaper on the last 10 days of January. The first editorial that we will be looking at is titled The Great American Arms Bazaar which came on the 22nd of January. This article can be broken down into three different parts. The first part which talks about the current American strategy for weapon sales. The second part about how the current President of the United States, Mr. Donald Trump, is trying to change it. And the third part is how India can benefit from the change in the defense policy of US. For us to understand this article better, there are four key questions which we have to answer first. The first is, why is foreign arms sales important for the US? And how does it happen? What are the guiding principles for weapon sales? And what are the actual steps involved in the process of weapon sales by the United States of America? Let's look at the first question. Why is foreign arms sales important for the United States? See, there are three very logical reasons for it. The first being to leverage its global influence. Since it's able to sell weapons to countries all over the world, it is able to dictate terms and also exert a lot of influence over the domestic and international policies of those countries. So it is a very crucial strategy which the United States uses in order to have control over the global dialogue. The second aspect is it reduces the cost of procurement for its own troops because since it's selling a lot of weapons to countries all over the world, it is able to reduce the cost of its own procurement by economics of scale. Since there is a lot of production, the cost is automatically going to go down. So that way, the United States itself benefits from such weapon sales. And the third is, it employs over 1.7 million people, 1.7 million Americans. So it is an employment generating sector. So in these three aspects, the United States benefits a lot because of arms sales. The next question that we have to answer is, how does arms transfer happen? There are three modes of transfer. First is foreign military sales which adds up to $30 billion a year for the United States, which accounts for a revenue of $30 billion a year for the United States. The next method is direct commercial sales, which is a $110 billion revenue for United States. And finally, it is foreign military financing, which is of $6 billion of revenue. See, foreign military sales happens when the United States government itself involves in selling equipment, arms equipment to other allies and friends across the world. Direct commercial sales happens when the defense industry itself decides to sell its weapon, its weapon systems to, to militaries across the world. Foreign military financing is done by the United States for its own strategic influence over certain areas in the world. For example, Israel is the largest such foreign military financing because it receives over $3.7 billion of this $6 billion finance. Also, Pakistan, Egypt, Jordan and many other countries also receive foreign military financing. So these are the countries where the United States wants to exert its strategic influence and strategic presence by means of selling them weapons. Now, does this sale happen only on a commercial basis? Actually, no. It happens, there are certain principles, guiding principles that the United States follows while it sells its weapons. And they are majorly based on strategic considerations, which means if such weapon sales is going to benefit the United States strategically, it is going to prefer selling weapons to those countries. As the United States State Department says, a proposed sale is approved only if found to further US foreign policy and national security interests. In other words, only if it benefits the United States, it is going to authorize the sale of weaponry. But then what are the steps involved in such sale? The first step is assessment by the Department of State and Department of Defense. And the primary purpose of these two departments is to ensure that the weapon systems that are sold doesn't end up in the hands of a third party. It means that when United States decides to sell weapons to a particular country, that country should not be funneling those weapon systems to, a, to another country or another armed 
organization which the United States does not support. Let's take an example. If the if United States sells weapons to Pakistan and if Pakistan back channels these weapons to armed terrorist organizations, which is against the United States interest, what it ultimately means is United States has given weapons against its own security. The United States has sold weapons which is going to act again, which may end up against its own national security, which may end up in the hands of people who work against its own national security. So the purpose of these two departments is to ensure that this does not happen. And this is precisely what they want to avoid. And that's what the state and defense departments are supposed to ensure. The White House, through the National Security Council, plays an important role in assessing and ensuring that the weapon sales takes place in a systematic fashion. Once they are in agreement, the congressional leaders of the House and the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations are informally consulted for their opinion. Once they are all on board, the sale is formally notified. So you notice that this, the process of weapon sales is not, it doesn't happen immediately. It is a multi-step process and it has several checks and balances. The United States has evolved this process through years of diplomatic and strategic experience. Now, having said that, the current US president is trying to change this entire process. So what is he trying to do? The first thing he wants to do is he wants to reduce the foreign military financing or funding. The money which we learned goes to friendly countries of the US like Israel, Pakistan and Jordan. Mr. Trump wants to reduce the foreign military aid. Moreover, he wants American partners such as South Korea and Japan to buy more weapons from the US because he wants the United States to receive revenue. Moreover, he wants American partners like South Korea and Japan to buy more weapons from the US. And this is a move to reduce the trade deficits which US has with South Korea and Japan. Donald Trump's attitude clearly shows that he has very little patience for linking human rights to arms sales. In any normal circumstance, every country will want to ensure that the weapons it sells doesn't end up killing innocent civilians or end up. But what we can clearly understand from Trump's policy is that he has very little patience for linking human rights to arms sales. And what is the overarching theme of his policy? He just want to liberalize the US arms sales across the world. Because he is being a businessman himself, he is more into commercial gains rather than strategic considerations. And he doesn't understand the nuances of arms sales and how sensitive it is. And he clearly doesn't understand the nuances that are behind arms sales. And he clearly doesn't understand the nuances that are present behind the weapon sales. Now let's look at all of this from the Indian perspective. See, India is one of the largest importers of arms. It has so far bought $15 billion worth of weaponry from the US over the past decade. But this is not entirely what India had requested because it has India wanted so much more amount of weaponry from the US it was willing to buy. But all its requests has been entangled in the US bureaucracy. The initial American strategic considerations always prevented India from acquiring US weapons and technology. Moreover, and a very important reason why the United States was not ready to sell weapons to India was India's closeness with Russia. Even today, 70% of India's weaponry comes from Russia. And the United States, even today, 70% of India's weaponry comes from Russia, which is not liked by the Americans. So with the change in the weapons sales policy because of Donald Trump, how can both countries benefit? Let's look at how the US can benefit from the change in policy. See, Trump emphasizes on commercial rather than strategic benefits. This is a key aspect of Trump's weapons policy. For the Americans, India could be a reliable, non-proliferating buyer of its arms. The United States need not worry about India going for nuclear pro proliferation because India has a very strong record of its own nuclear, of nuclear non-proliferation. And India has been a reliable partner for the US over several decades, for the past two decades. Moreover, US has a trade deficit with India. So by selling weapons to India, the US gets to bridge the gap between the trade deficit it shares with India. So in these methods, the United States tend to benefit if it follows Donald Trump's policy of weapon sales. India has always been wary of military alliances. So all India wants to do is just to buy it on a commercial terms 
on only on a business basis without entangling itself in any multilateral military alliance so it is more comfortable with weapons purchases on a commercial deal with the united states so we can clearly understand that even though trump's policy is not thought out in so many aspects india and us can definitely benefit from the new weapons sales strategy to conclude see such unconventional thinking has benefited both countries before and i'm talking about the civil nuclear deal which was signed during the upa rule and the author concludes that an unconventional thinking in terms of weapon sales can also be a win win for both countries moving on to the next article which is titled profit and loss which came on the 22nd of january this article tries to explain us about the position called parliamentary secretary and it tells whether it is a position of office of profit or not the election commission recently advised the president to disqualify 20 mlas belonging to the aam aadmi party and the grounds which the election commission told was they were holding office of profit to understand this article in its entirety we will have to understand about so many different terms like what is office of profit what do you mean by a parliamentary secretary and what are what are the methods in which you can disqualify an mla or an mp and why is the position of a parliamentary secretary of often referred as an office of profit and we will learn them one by one first let's try to look at who a parliamentary secretary is a parliamentary secretary is a position held by a person who is ranked equal to a minister the person holding the position may be responsible for one or two departments within the government and almost the same perks as a minister these positions are appointed especially for political reasons and it is given to those mlas who could not become ministers usually it is those mlas who could not become ministers who are made parliamentary secretaries note that there are no limits on the number of parliamentary secretaries the government can appoint the government can appoint several states across india has had parliamentary secretaries in its in the past delhi punjab telangana gujarat they all had parliamentary secretaries and all those appointments were later questioned which we will see subsequently now the first question that one gets is if you are going to appoint a person who is going to rank equal to a minister and who is going to enjoy as much benefits as a minister does why not simply makes them a minister in the cabinet it is not possible because you cannot create an unlimited number of ministers in a cabinet because of the provisions laid out in the constitution the first is article 239 aa which was introduced by the 69th amendment act of 1991 and it limits the number of ministers in delhi since this entire fiasco happened with regards to delhi the first article is article 239 aa which was written having delhi in mind it was by the 69th amendment act of 1991 and it limits the number of ministers in delhi to 10% of the total legislative assembly seats there are totally 70 legislative seats or 70 mla seats and 10% of it means only 7 ministers can be appointed in a in the cabinet of the chief minister of delhi and article 164 1a of the 91st amendment act of 2003 limits the number of ministers in all state cabinets this is for this is article 239 aa is exclusive for delhi and article 164 1a is for all states in india which restricts the number of ministers to 15% of the total number of legislative assembly seats so say if a state has 200 mlas it can only appoint 15% of it or 30 ministers so it is these restrictions laid out in the constitution which prevent the appointment of ministers beyond this 10% and 15% threshold what does the judiciary say with regards to appointment of parliamentary secretaries the judiciary has been very harsh in handling the appointment of parliamentary secretaries because from 2005 even as late as 2015 they had always struck down the appointment of such parliamentary secretaries across states in india the appointment of such secretaries in himachal pradesh goa telangana and west bengal were struck down by different high courts across india this clearly shows that the judiciary does not welcome the steps taken by the state to appoint a person as a parliament to appoint an mla as a parliamentary secretary 
Now, in the current case, these MLAs, the 20 Aam Aadmi Party MLAs were asked to be disqualified. But then what are the grounds for disqualifying an MLA? But then there are certain grounds laid out in the constitution for the disqualification of an MLA. Let's look at them. Article 102 Clause 1 talks about the grounds for disqualification of a member of parliament. And Article 191 Clause 1 talks about the disqualification of a member of a legislative assembly of a state. And the grounds are also listed in the articles. And the five grounds which are listed in the articles are holding an office of profit, which is what this, which is what we are going to deal with. If the MLA is of unsound mind, or maybe he or she is an undischarged insolvent. And in what is an undischarged insolvent? An insolvent is a person who is in debt and is unable to pay back his debt. An undischarged insolvent is one whose insolvency proceedings in the court has not yet been discharged off. Fourth ground for disqualification of an MLA or an MP is not being an Indian citizen or acquiring the citizenship of another country. And the final ground for disqualification is by law. Since we are dealing with this term office of profit in this article, let's try to understand what it means. The term itself refers to an executive appointment. What it means? An office of profit doesn't mean that a person is holding, one should not take the term literally. So if an MLA is holding a business where he is gaining profit, if a legislator is holding a private a position in a private business body, it doesn't mean, that doesn't mean he is holding an office of profit. We should not confuse the word office of profit with holding a position in a business where the legislator gets a profit. Office of profit means, office of profit simply means separation of legislation from executive. This term was introduced especially to make sure there is independence of the legislature and preservation of the separation of powers between legislature and executive. And the two articles which we saw before, 102 clause 1 and 191 clause 1, lays down specifically as to what restricts legislators from holding such office of profits. But then what position is called an office of profit in an executive? There should be certain conditions which has to satisfy in order to term an office, a position as an office of profit. There are four key conditions. The first is whether the government exercises control over the appointment, removal and performance of the functions of the office. Secondly, does it have any remuneration attached to it? Thirdly, does the body in which the office is attached has government powers like releasing money or allotment of land, granting licenses, etc. And finally, does the office enable the holder to influence by way of patronage? So if a position satisfies any or all of these conditions, that position is declared as an office of profit. Let's look at the case of Amadmi Party. In 2015, 21 MLAs were appointed as parliamentary secretaries by the Amadmi Party. In 16, the Delhi High Court, the very next year, the Delhi High Court sets aside those appointments because the Lieutenant Governor had not approved it. In that very same year, an advocate files a complaint with the Election Commission saying that such appointment of parliamentary secretaries should be quashed. And in 2018, and after several court hearings, this year, the Election Commission advised the President to disqualify those MLAs and the President concurs with the Election Commission. When there were so many court rulings against the appointment of parliamentary the appointment of parliamentary secretaries by different courts, by different high courts across India, why did the Ahmadmi Party, how did the Ahmadmi Party ra convince themselves and the people of Delhi that such appointments are okay? But that such appointments are okay. See what they told was the parliamentary secretaries so appointed by the Delhi government will not be eligible for any remuneration or prerequisites. They will only be allowed to use the government transport and office space with regards to their respective departments. But that's still not going to hold water because in Raman vs. P.T.A. Rahim in 1948, the judiciary clearly said that any positions that is capable of yielding pecuniary gains will be called as an office of profit. And even as late as in 2006, in the Jaya Bachchan vs. Union of India case, it again reiterated the judiciary again reiterated that a position will be called an office of profit even if one did not actually receive payment. It was enough if some pay was receivable. So these two judgments clearly say that 
the Delhi government's rationale in appointing parliamentary secretaries is not valid. The article concludes that there has been many judicial decisions against the appointment of such posts. Appointing parliamentary secretaries is clearly a mean to circumvent Article 164.1a. Hence, the Delhi government should not have appointed its MLAs into such positions because it was a clear case of conflict between duties and interests of the legislators. Moving on to the next article, which is titled Detecting the Change Early On, which came on the 23rd of January. This article tells us about how normal cells turn into cancer cells when there are some changes induced in the, in the cellular functions. For us to understand this article, we have to understand some of the keywords mentioned in it. Epithelial cells are cells which are present lining up the surfaces of blood vessels and the organs inside our body. A 3D culture or 3-dimensional culture is produced when biological cells are allowed to grow in a 3-dimensional environment like in a bioreactor. Unlike in a petri dish which is a 2D culture, a 2-dimensional culture, a 3D culture is where a cell is suspended in a bioreactor and allowed to grow. So they grow and form as spheres and spherical colonies. A transformation process is when a cell transforms from one type to another. DNA damaging agents are, as the term says, agents which damage the structure of DNA. An alkylating agent is one which adds an alkyl group to a biomolecule. For example, when the DNA is treated with an, alkyling, with an alkylating agent, an alkyl group is added to the DNA. An alkyl group here means it is of the formula Cn H2n plus 1. So C2 H5 is an alkyl group. And by alkylating a DNA, the DNA function can be impaired. Chemotherapy is a treatment method used for treating cancer patients where they use chemicals. Golgi apparatus are cellular organelles which are responsible for intracellular transport. Endoplasmic reticulum is involved in the folding and formation of proteins and it helps in transporting proteins from one part to another. And finally, the term cell polarity which is very important with regards to this article means the spatial differences with respect to a cell in terms of its function and structure. For example, if you take an epithelial cell, a cell and a nucleus, the top layer of it might be the layer exposed on the surface might be functioning in a certain way and the basal layer is attached to the inner membrane. So there is a spatial variation of how the epithelial cell functions. The top layer is exposed and the bottom layer is attached to the basal membrane. So this clear demarcation of functions is called as cell polarity. Let's try to understand the concept of DNA repair mechanisms. When cells are exposed to DNA damaging agents such as ultra, such as ionizing radiation, ultraviolet light, air pollution, smoking and many other etc. The DNA is subject to tremendous pressure and is damaged and immediately the DNA repair mechanism is set in motion. But when such mechanism fails and such accumulated errors can further develop as cancer in the future. Now that we have understood some of the basic concepts behind this article, let's dive into the article. Indian scientists have performed experiments with regards to understanding how a cell changes from being a normal cell to a cancerous cell. Now we will look at how they did it. First, they induced the cancerous cell transformation by using an alkylating agent. So they add an alkylating agent to the DNA and thus induced a DNA repair. This they did by and the repair was see that agent activated the DNA PK gene and this DNA PK gene disrupted the structure and functions of the Golgi apparatus which we saw earlier. In this diagram you can clearly see how alkylation takes place. This is guanine. This alkyl group is added it becomes methyl guanine and this ultimately changes the structure of DNA. And what was the result of this? The cells which usually looks like this is now turned into a cancerous cell, is now turned into a cancerous cell group. And how did this happen? And how did this happen? The movement of proteins 
from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi was severely disturbed and this changed the cell polarity because earlier cells were the bottom of the cells were attached to the basement and the top was exposed after the change in cell polarity cells started growing in different ways without any orientation or without knowing what their specific function was so this is what is called as cancerous growth and such disruption of cell polarity is one of the hallmarks of cancer so what is the conclusion of this experiment indian researchers have for the first time studied the early stages of normal cells transforming into cancerous cells this understanding is important because this is how one can find out how cancer happens how cancerous cells develop and with that understanding one can understand what we should and shouldn't do in order to avoid getting cancer moving on to the next article which is titled at whose discretion which came on the 24th of january this article talks about the discretionary powers of the governor with regards to omitting parts of the speech written by the cabinet for him to read what is the story behind this article the kerala governor mr p sadasivam skipped certain parts of the speech written by the kerala state government cabinet at the start of its budget session this issue has become a topic of a huge debate across the country because governors normally speak the address prepared by the executive or the cabinet but there has been previous instances where governors have skipped parts of the speech written by the executive in 1969 a governor of west bengal in 1969 in 1980 and in 2017 governors have different governors have skipped parts of speech written by the executive on different occasions for very for different reasons one reason was the speech was against the union government another was mostly the reason is because it goes against the union government it talks against the union government or it goes against any constitutional body like that of the judiciary which was the case with regards to the west bengal governor which was the case in 1980 so now the question is what is binding on the governor in shamsher singh versus the state of punjab case the attorney general of india opined that the president or the governor are bound to the cabinet decisions relating to addressing the house returning a bill for consideration assenting and withholding an assent so if you notice there is nothing really told about omitting parts of the speech prepared by the cabinet in the sibranjan chatterjee in the book governor's role in the indian constitution it says that constitution makers the council of ministers should prepare a speech and the governor should read it any violation of that amounts to breach of the constitution however any omission by the governor may not be unlawful but will be detrimental to the parliamentary system of our country let's look at one specific case here in 1969 west bengal governor skipped parts of his speech prepared by the executive which related to the dismissal of an earlier ministry in 1967 this action by the governor was called as unconstitutional but there was some support for the governor because the omitted portions questioned the high court judgments see the governor has an obligation to protect the high court's position one cannot go against the judiciary the governor himself cannot talk anything against the judiciary hence the governor's action in this case was not unlawful nor is in violation of the established convention the conclusion is the governor has an obligation what was written by the executive simultaneously the council of ministers too had an obligation to make sure that no remarks about the governor's own past actions are included in the speeches with regards to matters of policy the governor must read whatever that was written by the executive and even in that he will have the option to omit if certain words will invite criticism moving on to the next article which is titled reform with caution which came on the 24th of january this report deals exclusively around the malimath committee report on the reformation of the criminal justice system in india so let's learn about malimath committee it was constituted in 2003 under the chairmanship of justice v s malimath and its objective is in examining the fundamental principles of the criminal law 
to restore confidence of the people on our criminal justice system. A subsequent function of the committee is also to review the CRPC, IPC and the Evidence Act. And this review is to ensure that the criminal justice system stays adaptive and responsive to the changing times. Note that some recommendations of Malimuth Committee are already in place. Example, permitting videography of statements, expanding the definition of rape and inclusion of new offences against women and victim compensation. These are all steps in the right direction. However, some recommendations are not included and the author says that it is better that we don't include these recommendations. And what are those? And what are they? Making confessions to high-ranking officials admissible in court. Increasing the period of police custody from the current 15 to 30 days. Doubling the 90-day period available for the police to file charges after which the accused can be released on bail. So the author feels that these recommendations may be going against human rights. There is a term mentioned in the article called as standard of proof. What does Malimuth Committee report talk about? say about standard of proof? It says that a clear and convincing standard is good enough to be admissible in court against the currently existing beyond reasonable doubt standard. This is a dilution of the standard of proof that is required by the court in order to convict a person. What it exactly means is, if the court is convinced that something is true, that is good enough. And if this recommendation is implemented, it would have severe implications for suspects. Because the dilution, since the standard of proof is diluted, a person can be easily convicted and such a measure will have very adverse implications on suspects which are who are currently under trial. So why such harsh punishments? Why such harsh measures? Why does Malimath Committee recommend measures which can go, which possibly treads into violation of human rights? And the answer for that question was given by the draft national policy on criminal justice of the Madhav Menon Committee. This draft says that there is a popular dissatisfaction against our criminal justice system and which is because there is very low rate of conviction and the role money and influence plays in the outcome of the judgment of a case delayed and denied justice, delayed justice, lack of protection to witnesses and inadequate attention to crime victims. These reasons are why there is severe dissatisfaction and discontent by the people against our, against India's criminal justice system. And in order to address these dissatisfactions, such harsh measures have been in the Malimath Committee report. The conclusion of the article is, criminal justice systems should be revamped, but any substantive change in the way how it functions should be carefully thought out. It should not happen as a knee-jerk response. One must also ensure that constitutional safeguards are present for the suspects to defend themselves from abuse of police or judicial powers. And finally, investigation and trial should not be altered to the extent where it undermines the justice system in our country. Thanks for watching this video and for more such videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and for more free civil service examination related content, please subscribe to our Telegram channel. Thank you.